bluebells? It's um, the intergenerational project that I'm doing with Tina, who's yeah. a music therapist. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it involves us taking nursery children into a care home where we sing traditional songs, mm. tell traditional stories, play traditional games and do musical improvis improvisations and um, and it's all about intergenerational cohesion so that the children feel connected to their community and the older people um, don't feel isolated from their community and so... Um, so it's a real kind of community project? Though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Mm. It sounds really good. Mm. It's lovely. It's really lovely yeah. and delightful. And the trouble is that because of COVID, we can't do it anymore. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. So what we're doing is moving operations online. Mm. I want to tell stories online to give people an idea of what storytelling is. I want to show people how to take stories off the page and tell them like they were a memory. Oh wow, um, that sounds amazing. Yeah, because I'd I'm, love to do that. Yeah, well, I'm hoping it will be a um, a skill, a new skill that people would like to learn. Yeah, and um, because then they can use it for just playing with children, people in the community. Yeah, exactly. And what I would really love to do would be to teach you how to tell a story to Lucia. Yeah. Oh wow, um, yeah. my little granddaughter. Yeah. So I've got this book, Yeah. okay? Yeah. It's called um, The Coming of the Unicorn. Mm -hmm. This wasn't written, it was transcribed from the stories of Duncan Williamson, who was a tradition bearer, and he knew 2,000 stories and about 3,000 songs, and he was a Scottish traveller. He was born on the banks of Loch Fyne, he was one of 16. He was seventh son of seventh son of seventh son, and apparently that was lucky. They never saw TV. They didn't have any books, but what they did have was thousands of stories, and they had stories every night. So every night after the work was done, they'd all sit around the campfire. They told stories in a family situation, so it wasn't just stories for the children. Um, so it really was an intergenerational affair. I wanted to find a story um, um, because I was doing some work with you, wasn't I? Yeah, that was about um, your doctorate research. Father's involvement with their sons starting school. Right. Yeah. And so that's what I did my doctoral thesis on. Yeah. And um, so basically, um, it was about being a man yeah being a father this led led on to how fathers can um help in educational outcomes yeah because um the research previous research shows that fathers are not um involved in things like homework mm. and that the primary school classroom is very sort of feminized mm. and I was trying to think of ways to make it easier for my grandson to yeah. start school mm. and the story you can glean so much wisdom and insight and um, you can sort of hack it for such interesting life lessons uh, which is one of the reasons why I love storytelling yeah okay and so I found myself on Facebook <laughs> and da -da -da -da, anybody got any good good stories for father's involvement with home to school transition? And I thought, no way, you know, nobody's going to come up with a good story. But, you know, within moments, storyteller friends of mine on Facebook, um, Carl Merry, Amy Douglas, you know, they were just like, Jack's first day at school. It's like, <laughs> OK, then. They said, we, do, we don't know what book it's in because Duncan's wife, Linda Williamson, she transcribed loads and loads and loads of his stories. And there are loads of Duncan Williamson books like this that you mm -hmm. can you can mm. buy, you know, online. And, um, and so I, I just... Googled as many as I could and I and I if I could I could look through the contents but I just ordered loads of them anyway because I'm I love Duncan's stories and when I read them I can hear him 
Oh, and that, I know, yeah. that was so lovely. <laughs> I love that so much. It's brilliant. I'm calling it Jack's first day at school, but here's the, you know, typical oral tradition. It's actually called Jack Goes Back to School. Oh. Okay. And this is Jack, you know, yes. this is Jack in all of the Jack tales, all of the Jack tales when he gets involved with the devil or if he gets involved with blacksmiths and giants and all the adventures of Jack. This story is about when Jack gets really old and he is no longer um, out having adventures, but... Um, He's living with his daughter, and her name is Mary. And that's lovely and fitting, isn't it? Because <laughs> you're Mary. Yeah. And, um, and I'd really... Um, anyway, so, um, so we did a little bit of work together with this story, and we yeah. did some yeah. research stuff that was brilliant fun. And, um, but you never told the story. No, okay. I've never told the story. So like, so like, you know this story yes, because I've yeah. told it to you quite a yes, lot of times. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so in yeah. a way, you probably know it as well as you you know Sleeping Beauty or Cinderella or Snow White. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know it, but would you feel um, confident that you could tell it really fluently in one go, without no. saying um manar and? No, I couldn't. Yeah, I couldn't. Okay, mm. so. So what I want you to do is to teach you how to do that, how to tell it with fluency, yeah. where you don't have to worry about what words you're using mm. because you tell it as if you're telling an anecdote. You know, you okay. tell it like you're telling a memory. Yeah. Okay, so we moved into another room, made a cup of tea, got some biscuits, and we're gonna start working on the story. So we've got a big piece of paper with a grid in it and there's these funny little codes and what they stand for is beginning of the beginning, middle of the beginning, end of the beginning, beginning of the middle, middle of the middle, end of the middle and so forth until we get to the end of the end. Okay, and you see this little code up here, A, E, D, that's to um, get us to work on action emotion, description. So what we're going to do is separate out the action of the story, the emotion of the story and the description of the story so that we can explore those independently and then when we put them all back together um, we're going to be able to tell the story. So what we're going to do then mum, Yeah. first of all in these nine grids, what you have to do is you have to divide up the action of the story into just nine points. So think of it as nine action points. Just tell us what happens. Don't think about the emotion, so don't use any emotional language. Um, don't think about the emotions of any of the characters. Don't think about the emotions of the audience. Don't think about the emotions of yourself as a teller. Okay? Um, then... Uh, don't think about, don't use any descriptive words, okay? So we just want to know what happened, what's the action, okay? So can you do that for us? Mm. Make it so. Cool, that was quick. Well done. Fantastic. So what you've got is nine moments in the story, nine moments of action. Maybe you could think of those as being a bit like postcards. And when you think of those moments, can you visualize the um, images of these moments of action in your mind's eye? Yes. So, so do you think you've got quite a visual um, imagination? Yeah. Okay, because it's interesting that yeah. some people don't don't have much of a visual imagination, and the way that they um, more remember stories is more to do with um, sensation, so maybe feelings of things, and um, maybe sounds of things. Okay, but many people um, do seem to have this this visual memory. Okay, so so we're going to kind of go with that. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so what I'm going to say is perhaps the most important thing that you need to be doing when you're telling a story 
um, is to visualize it. Okay, so mm -hmm. the idea is, is that you um, see the images in your mind and then you just tell what you see. So you've got to get into that process of seeing images and then the words coming out of your mouth. Thank you very much. Um, and um, the other really important thing that you need to do when you're telling a story is to um, improvise. Okay, okay. So, so you will not be reciting this story. You will not learn it off by heart and recite okay. it. Okay. Um, there's very important reasons for that. It's because if you, if you recite, then um, you're not really responding to whoever you're telling the story to. And also, um, it means that you, it, it will be then difficult for you to play with it. Okay, mm. the salient thing about telling a story, and especially to little ones, is to be able to play with the story and move in and weave in and out of it, okay, as if it's just the most natural thing. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, we, we must absolutely not recite, we must improvise, and what can help you to improvise is to visualise. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's going to happen is we're going to do all this work on the story and then we're going to screw it all up and throw it away and just tell the story. Okay, okay. so I'm taking you through the process. So what we've got is nine points and now what I want you to do is condense, is to condense these nine points into three points. Okay. So all of the beginning points and then all of the middle points and then all of the end points of action I just want you to turn them into three points of action go for it brilliant so um, what Mary just did was she she turned the nine points into three points and then she turned the three points into one point and then she turned the one point into one word and that one word is summing up the whole of the story for her now what we're going to get you to do is a very precious simple magical thing and we're going to get you to go out in the garden and find a little object. Now, Shona Lee would call this a midrash object. So go out into the garden, find a little midrash object to represent to you gold. Thanks. Okay, Mum, so what have you got? I've got a Chinese lantern mm -hmm. fruit. Mm. And when you saw it, did you just no, that was the object that you needed to choose. Well, on the way out, I thought I would get a crab apple, and then I saw the Chinese lanterns, and I thought, no, that's that's more like gold than a crab apple. <laughs> so I went for this. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. Why, why, why does gold sum up the story for you? Because I think. The story was all about Jack wanting to keep the gold, and he 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 cooked up a plan in his head mm. for how he could keep the gold, mm. and the plan was to hoodwink the justices of the peace. Mm. Okay, cool. Brilliant. So that's like the thing that's driving the whole story. Yeah. 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 Okay. Brilliant. Oh, lovely. Thanks. <laughs> now, um, one more thing um, to do with gold. Now, what, what I want you to do now, and um, I'm not actually going to ask you to do it today, mm -hmm. but I'm going to ask you to think about it over the next couple of days, and I want you to come up with a riddle, okay? And the answer to that riddle is going to be gold, okay? Okay. Is that okay? Because yeah. um, another thing that Shona Lee teaches, um, and one of the ways that she holds all of her stories is for each story that she has, there is a riddle. And that riddle is like the kind of gateway into the story. So, so this is a task that you're going to do tonight after I've gone. And that's for you to um, invent a riddle where the answer is gold. 
<clears throat> and riddles are really interesting because you never want people to get the answer. Do you? You want it, you want you want it to perplex them and you want it to be difficult and you want them to have to be inventive to work out what the answer is. Okay. Okay. Mm. Cool. That's quite hard. It is hard, yeah. Mm. Yeah. It is hard. Um, do you want to talk about why it's hard? Uh, well, I mean, I thought I'd just try and think of something very quickly. Yeah. Um, then if I thought about it very quickly, then it'd be very quick to get the answer. Yeah. So I'm going to have to think about it. You've got to be because I didn't I didn't actually I didn't quite understand that riddles were supposed to be hard. Mm. I thought riddles were supposed to be easy and that there was I was a bit thick because I didn't find them easy. Oh god that's so interesting. <laughs> Heartbreaking, isn't it? Because other people, you know, all through school and everything, <laughs> other people could work out what riddles were and I couldn't. Yeah, it's because they're hard, man. <laughs> That's the whole thing. Yeah, but why could they do it and I couldn't? Well, maybe they had the, you know, they had different, they had references that they could... You know, maybe they had cultural mm. references. Well, maybe that that's easier. just my memory, and my memory is maybe distorted. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting to think about that. But yeah, riddles are meant to be hard. Okay. Yeah, riddles are meant to be mm. um, trying to outwit you and outfox you. Mm. Mm. And um, they're, 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 they're for tricksters. You know, if you think about riddles, how riddles are used... Um, they're used by by the Sphinx, for example, um, who's keeping the um, city of Thrace under threat and oppressed. And it's only when Oedipus comes along and solves a riddle that the people are released from the power of the Sphinx. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, the Sphinx wasn't having a laugh. You know, the Sphinx didn't want anybody to get that riddle. Yeah. Riddles are hard. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Wow. Yeah, so... Um, so then what? So um, I don't want to screw it up and throw it away, that's the trouble. No, but you, you, you don't have to screw it up and throw it away. You, you metaphorically screw it up and throw oh, it right. away. Oh, right, so I can keep my piece of paper Well, it's with beautiful work, work, isn't it? It's yeah. beautiful work <laughs> yeah. already. Mm. Do you feel like you've, you're, you've, you're, you're in a project? It. Yeah. Yeah, and you're on a roll and you're doing yeah. something. Okay, yeah. well, that's so gorgeous. Mm. Let's turn the page over and let's... Um, you've got your homework on the back. And yeah. let's now um, do some work on emotion. Okay. So um, for each of these um, nine squares, mm. I would like you to um, think about the salient emotion of the main character. Okay, so who is the main character? Of the whole story? Yeah. Jack? Yeah, mm. okay. So... Um, what what are his emotions? Okay, so what I want you to do is go is go for each of those moments. Mm. Just identify what the most important emotion is mm. for for that um, section. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lovely. So we have nine emotions here. Could you read them to us? Contentment. Worry, excitement, intention, determination, resolve, stay cool, hoodwink, satisfaction. Okay, fantastic. And um, if you wanted to, you could play around with those emotions, couldn't you? You could turn them into some a little, a little poem or a little um, something or other to... Um, 
to break up the narrative if you wanted to. So, so, so there's a lot of work you could do with just those emotions mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. and you could put rhythms to them and and make up a little song or something. So, um, so that would be really great. There's so much work that you can do on emotions. It's really exciting, mm -hmm. and I find that when I'm when I'm working on emotions, I want to create a great. Um, mind map of, of every single emotion that there is and mm. when you do that mm. you um, start to see the relationship between emotions and desires so for example here you have intention and I know what you mean because mm. in, intention seems such um, you know it does seem like such an emotional thing but it's but it's it's not just a pure emotion in a way. You can think about how how intention might be might be more of a or or less of a desire. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think I think that emotions and um, emotions and desires they they kind of intersect with each other, mm -hmm. and it's just really lovely to think about that. Mm -hmm. And um, you know determination as well like how much of that is a desire and how much of it is an emotion mm, we mm. know we know that it's got a particular feel mm -hmm. so it gets us to um, reflect on our own emotions and it gets us to consider the words we use for different emotions and then when we have those discussions about emotions we sort of form agreements on what's the right one you know yeah and as a psychologist you know all about that and it's you know <laughs> yeah it's, it's incredibly interesting mm. so um so you've done that for jack but if you wanted to um you could do you could make up your own homework okay mm -hmm. so you could do um mary's emotional journey and her husband's emotional journey mm -hmm. and and you could make up little emotional journeys for all the children, the eldest one, the middle one, and the youngest one, and all the ones in between. Mm, mm. So, um, so there's plenty of work that you can do with emotion, but it doesn't end there. Because you need to think about the emotional states that your audience are going to be in as you move through the story. Mm -hmm. So you could also um, think about what, what their emotions might be at these nine different points. Mm -hmm. And then you as a teller, you have um, your emotional arc that you go through when you tell it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we've considered the emotions of the audience and we've considered the emotions of the teller. We've considered the emotions of all of the different characters but these are traditional stories these are stories that come from a people so we also have to think of the um, the place where this came from and the people where this came from and it's probably at this point that you need to do a little bit of research about um, the Scottish travellers. I suggest that you Google Duncan. Um, there's the School of um, Storytelling in Edinburgh, the Scottish School of Storytelling. Um, and that there's, there's plenty that you can find out about so that when you're telling this story, you have the emotional history of those people mm. in your mind and you can honour that. And, um, and, I, and that's, that's really important because when we tell traditional stories, we're, telling, we're not telling anecdotes, you know, I'm not telling you about how I feel, I'm telling you the story of the people and, and it's hazardous, you know, mm. storytellers have made big mistakes in the past, so we need to be careful, we need to be respectful, um, but Duncan always wanted people to tell these stories and I know that he would be absolutely delighted that I'm here making a video of how to tell one of his stories to mm. my mum so mm. she can tell it to my niece. Mm -hmm. So um, I know Duncan would want you to do that, but, um, but you know, we've, there's work to do. There's work mm. to do. Okay. Well, I think we've done a lot of work today, and I think that's probably enough. Okay. Thank you. Now, when, yeah. when Shona Lee teaches how to tell stories... She has, um, she has 14 exercises that she does for five different types of telling. And I think that adds up, if I'm not very good at maths, but I think it's about 79 then exercises that she will do on a story. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've given you some fragments of a few exercises 
um, some of which are heavily, heavily influenced by what she would do. But can you see that there's still a massive amount of work? There's loads of other things that you mm, could do, mm. but those those exercises that I've given you, you you now I can see it in in your reactions. Mm. I can see that you've got an idea of how you could take them forward and how you could use those mm -hmm. exercises so that you can tell the story so that you can tell the story in the way that you want to tell it. So so what we'll do is we'll leave it there now. Okay. You've got the riddle to make up. Yeah. You've got um, the emotional journeys to explore. Um, next time I see you, we'll talk about description, and um, and then there's all of all of the research about the story. Mm. Um, teller about Duncan, the research about Duncan and Scottish traveller people. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>
beautiful coins made of rose gold. You know, like the kind of gold that your mummy's wedding ring is made of. That that colour. And they look a bit like um, Chinese lanterns when they get older. And that was the kind of colour that they were, a beautiful kind of uh, um, sort of rose-coloured, golden colour. And he thought, wow, with this gold, I, I could, I wouldn't have to keep doing all this cultivating of the, of the garden and, and growing food that hurts my back. I'd have enough, I've, we'd got enough money here to feed all the family. And I wouldn't, if I could keep this gold, then we would be happy and safe forevermore. The whole family would be. I thought, well, I'll, I'll just take it upstairs and hide it and then see um, what to do about it. Uh, I'll give it, a, I'll think about it. So he came downstairs and he thought, I know what, I think, you know, because the children have been so unsettled lately and fed up about going to school, I think I would really like to go to school with them tomorrow. So he called Mary, his daughter, and he said, Mary, Mary, get the scissors. I want you to cut my trousers down. I'm going to school tomorrow. I'm going with the children to school. And Mary said, why are you doing that, Dad? And he said, I want a change. I'm fed up with digging the soil and cultivating the ground to produce food for this whole family. I want a day off. I want to go and see what it's like at school. These children keep moaning and groaning about school and I just don't believe it's as bad as they say it is. So I want to go and see it for myself to see exactly what it's like. So Mary got the big scissors and she cut his trousers just above the knee so that you could see his knobbly knees and they found some books for him to carry into school and they, they put a strap around the books and he put them over his shoulder and he walked with the children to school. It was quite a, it was quite a long walk in those days and they didn't have a car so it was all part of the whole thing about getting to school was that was the, the walk. And once they got to school, he really enjoyed it. He sat down and he listened to the teacher and he did as he was told. And at play group, at playtime, they went into the playground and they played all kinds of games like um, hide and seek and it. And he, they also did singing and dancing and played nursery rhymes and they sang Ring a Ring of Roses. They all held hands and they went round in a circle singing Ring a Ring of Roses, a pocket full of verses, a tissue, a tissue, we all fall down. Fishes in the water, fishes in the sea, we all jump up with a one, two, three. And they went back into the classroom when the bell rang. And then they sat down and they did their lessons and they and granddad was as good as gold. I mean, the teacher was really impressed with his behavior and he was very helpful around the classroom and and helped to put things away. He helped to put the slates away and the pens and the chalks and they all walked home after school back to the house. When they got back to the house, Mary was really pleased to see them and they had their dinner and they went to bed. Then a few days went by and Grandad had to go back out into the garden to do his work in the garden to cultivate the soil to 
um, grow the potatoes and the cabbages and the currants and the apples. And he was busy digging in the garden again. And he looked up and he could see a car approaching. And it had a blue light on the top and it was going, Nina, Nina. And he thought, wow, I wonder what that's coming here for. And so two policemen got out of the car with their and put their helmets on. And he, they were looking very stern and important. And Grandad was the only one at home and, and they said to him, could you tell us, old man, have you seen any gold? And Jack said, yes, because he couldn't tell a lie. He, he, he was a good person and he couldn't tell a lie to the police. So he said, yes, I, I did see some gold. Um, and the policeman said, well, where is it? And he said, it's upstairs. I put it upstairs under the bed. I, I, I put it up there and it, it came in a, in a bag, in a, in a sort of kind of like carpet bag. And, and it was full up with gold. And I put it, I put it under the stairs. And then I thought, oh no, that's not safe there. The children will find it there. So I took it up to my bed and I put it under my bed. And, I, 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 and it's still there. I, I didn't know what to do. I, I was so worried about it. I didn't know what to do. And the policeman said, oh, well, we better see this gold. Can you take us to it, please? And he said, "Yes, you can. You you can come up the come upstairs and 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 see the gold for yourself." And the policeman said, "Now, when was it? When was it that you got you found this gold?" And Jack said, "Well, it was the day after I went to school." And the policeman said, oh, really? That what, the day after you went to school? And he said, oh, no, 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 it wasn't the day after, it was the day before. Yeah, that's right, it was the day before I went to school. Yeah, I found the gold, and then I went to school. And the policeman said, well, that's all right then isn't it? You, you don't have to worry about it anymore. And, and Jack said, well, can I keep it then? And the policeman said, yes, old man, you can keep it. All right. Now we're going to go now. And are you sure I can keep the gold? And the policeman said, yes, you can keep it. And after the policeman left, Jack went up the rickety stairs and looked under the bed, pulled out the bag and opened it and inside was the beautiful rose gold coins. And Jack knew that he and his family would be taken care of for forever more. Good night, Lucia. Sleep tight.